Are you ready for a great adventure? Today on The World is Yours. The Pacific Northwest is where we'll begin, in a city with a tower that touches space itself, and where coffee is king, Seattle, Washington. Then it's over the Pacific Ocean to a land full of spirit and wonder, where we'll visit some remarkable temples and even traverse the desert expanse of Mongolia. Finally, we'll head to one of the largest islands in the world, where a country rich with cultural diversity awaits. Did you know people speak hundreds of different languages in Papua New Guinea? We've got a good one in store today. Let's go. The world is waiting and the world is yours. Seattle is the largest city in both the state of Washington and the Pacific Northwest region of the United States. It's one of the fastest growing cities in America with a bustling economy and big cultural impact on the country. Seattle sits on a narrow bit of land connecting two large bodies of water, Lake Washington and Puget Sound. All that water makes Seattle a major port which led to so much of the city's initial growth. The region has a rich Native American history with the first inhabitants living here over 4,000 years ago. The name Seattle even comes from the great chief, Seal. Chief Seal helped those traveling west in the 19th century to settle in the region, forming bonds and promoting peace between the different cultures. And his legacy was honored with the naming of this great city. Seattle began as a logging and shipping center but has since become home to many major retail and technology companies' headquarters. And let's not forget, the music scene in Seattle is vibrant, with many jazz clubs where some of America's most notable musicians built their chops, like Ray Charles and Quincy Jones. And the grunge movement started with iconic bands like Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, and others. Even Jimi Hendrix, one of the greatest guitarists to ever pick up a six string was born right here in Seattle, Washington. How cool is that? Seattle is one of the longest running farmers markets in America. Pike Place Market first opened in 1907 on Elliott Bay, part of Puget Sound, where craftsmen and artists set up shops. And over 10 million tourists flock here to shop each year. That's a lot of shoppers. It's considered the biggest tourist attraction in Seattle and even one of the top 50 must-visit places in the entire country. Wow! The market is built into a hill, so it features layered rows of merchants. The upper level on the street features people peddling fish, produce, and crafts, with their shops set up in booths that are covered by arch passageways. In the lower levels is where we'll find all the antiques, collectibles, even comic books and local family-owned restaurants where we can stop in to get a bite. The Pike Place Market is so important to the Seattle community, it's even designated as a historic neighborhood. One of the coolest parts of being here has to be visiting the Pike Place Fish Market. As we walk through the fish market, we'll see as the vendors throw giant slabs of fish back and forth, across the aisles, and when you ask to buy a fish, one employee picks it up and tosses it over to another to wrap it up for you. But be ready, just in case they throw it right to you. The story has it that fishmongers, a term for fish salespeople, got tired of walking to and from the fish table in the center. So they put someone there to throw the fish to whomever was asking for it. These flying fish, as they've been called, are legendary in Seattle. Not only do you get some really awesome fresh fish, you get quite a show too. Another major visitor spot at the market is the Starbucks on 1912 Pike Place. Starbucks was first started in 1971 on Western Avenue. It moved to Pike Place in 1977. Though the chain has expanded across the world, the original coffee shop, right here in the Pike Place Market, is still operating and has been since it first opened. If we go back in time, we can get a coffee at the very birthplace of one of Seattle's world-influencing mega-corporations. What is that in the sky over there? Is it a spaceship? Not quite, but close. It's Seattle's Space Needle Tower. 
This observation tower is an iconic image in Seattle's skyline. Built in the Seattle Center in time for the 1962 World's Fair hosted there. Over two million people attended the World's Fair. And thousands took the elevator up to the top to see the 360 degree view of the city. The Space Needle is 605 feet high, 138 feet wide, and it weighs over 9,000 tons. That's 18 million pounds. The observation deck at the top of the tower is 520 feet off the ground. And the rotating restaurant, called Sky City, is just below that. Elevators travel at 10 miles an hour, bringing visitors to the top in just seconds. And even on the most particularly windy days, the tower can withstand gusts over 200 miles per hour. I wouldn't bet on the people below being able to withstand winds that fast. The design of the Space Needle is a combination of two original ideas. The first, a sketch of a giant balloon tied to the ground by Edward E. Carlson. And the second, a flying saucer by John Graham. Both were the top ideas for a monumental structure leading into the fair. And a compromise between the two led to the tower we have now. It's amazing what a little compromise can bring, don't you think? The Space Needle remains one of the most iconic skyscrapers in the world. Before we leave Seattle, we've got to see a baseball game at the incredible Safeco Field. Known as the Safe to locals in Seattle, the stadium is very unique. It has a retractable roof, which means the top can be mechanically pulled back during sunny weather and cover the top of the field when it rains or snows. But do you know what makes this retractable roof different from all the others? The sides of the stadium are still open, letting air and light in just like if you were outside. So Seattle's Major League Baseball team, the Mariners, can play a game in the rain and the fans still feel like they're outside the whole time. Just not getting rained on, pretty cool. The stadium holds 47,000 seats and has a number of features meant to feel like the old ballparks of the 1940s and 50s. Like the brick walls, the natural grass field, and the surrounding city streets and buildings that make it feel like an authentic American ballpark. Safeco has its modern amenities too. Luxury suites and a wide variety of food and drink options make it the perfect compromise for the fans of baseball's past history and the future of America's favorite pastime. Nothing like a day at the ballpark to get a dose of some Seattle pride. After the game is over, it'll be time to head to our next destination. But first, let's test your world knowledge. In the year 1209, the conqueror and ruler, Genghis Khan, founded which empire that would become one of the largest and most impactful empires in history? A, the Roman Empire, B, the British Empire, C, the Mongol Empire, D, Empire Records. The answer coming up when we return to The World Is Yours. We're back. Let's find out the answer to our question. In the year 1209, the conqueror and ruler, Genghis Khan, founded which empire that would become one of the largest and most impactful empires in history? A, the Roman Empire. B, the British Empire. C, the Mongol Empire. D, Empire Records. If you said C, the Mongol Empire, you're right. Genghis Khan founded the Mongol Empire by uniting many tribes in Northeast Asia, becoming the ruler, the Khan, of the growing empire. An empire that went on to conquer much of Europe and Asia. In fact, the Mongol Empire at one point had control over 9 million square miles of the world's land, a whopping 16% of the entire world. That's amazing. The Mongol Empire was second only to the British Empire in terms of global domination. The culture of the Mongol Empire is now present in the modern day country of Mongolia. 
Mongolia lies directly between Russia to the north and China to the south, covering over 600,000 square miles. But with a population of only 3 million people, it is the least densely populated country in the entire world, meaning it has very few people spread out over a large amount of space. It is one of the largest landlocked countries, with most of the country covered in desert and mountains, not usable to farm. So, it's no surprise that nearly half of the entire Mongolian population lives in the capital city, Ulaanbaatar. A remaining third is nomadic, which means the people of these tribes move from place to place, never settling for extended periods of time. These modern nomads share traits with those united during the Mongol Empire. Horses are a massive part of the Mongol culture. Most of these nomadic Mongolians travel with herds of horses. They're almost always on horseback. And the horse population of 3 million in Mongolia is more than that of the people. Horses are highly respected in Mongolian culture, as they served as a key factor in the Mongol Empire's conquest over the Eastern world. We are sure to see plenty of horses as we travel through Mongolia. And we may even get to ride across the Mongolian countryside. The first place we must ride to is the Gorky Terelj National Park. There is a zone for visitors full of what they call tourist camps, where we can land before heading out to explore the natural wonders in the park, past the Tul River, before we reach the Gorkin Pass, is where we'll find all the best attractions. In the valley of the Terelj River, there is a small settlement with little shops, local restaurants, and horses and camels we can rent to take us through some of the park's trails to see the many landmarks. We'll visit the Kagin Lake, a beautiful glacial lake just up the river. And close by are the Yesti Hot Water Springs. There are two well-known rock formations that climbers travel here to see. Malkilkad, or Turtle Rock, named for the way it resembles you guessed it, a turtle. And the praying llama rock, which is also sometimes called the old man reading a book. Do you see that when you look at it? Maybe if you squint and tilt your head to one side. There's a Buddhist monastery in the Gorky Terelj National Park. In fact, Mongolia is known for its Buddhist monasteries. The Erdenzu Monastery is one of the oldest Buddhist monasteries in Mongolia that is still in use today. This temple is part of the Tibetan Buddhist sect or group called Gelug. Fun fact, the Mongolian ruler Altan Khan invited the Buddhist monk Sonam Gyatso to Mongolia to teach his people. Gyatso declared Altan Khan the reincarnation of the former ruler Kublai Khan and in return Alton gave Gyatso the title of Dalai Lama from the Mongolian Dalai Nichan. It was the creation of the title of the holiest Tibetan monk in Tibetan Buddhism, which became the official religion of Mongolia. The ruler of the Kalka Mongol tribe, Abtai Sayan Khan, after meeting with the Dalai Lama, ordered that the Erdenzu Monastery be built. By the 19th century, it contained 62 temples and was home to 1,000 monks. The Erdenzu Monastery is still an active place of worship, as well as a museum for tourists and travelers to explore and learn about this great religion. Outside of the regions where nomadic tribes roam, there's a large desert expanse that covers much of Southern Mongolia, from the Altai Mountains to the Tibetan Plateau lies the Great Gobi Desert. Many stops along the historic trade route, the Silk Road, existed in the Gobi Desert. And it is a major part of the Mongol Empire's historic conquest, reaching 1,000 miles across the continent and covering 500,000 square miles. It is the second largest desert in Asia and the fifth largest in the entire world. It's a stunning sight, though not a place we want to stay too long so let's pack our bags and head off to our final location. But first, let's test your world knowledge. The island of New Guinea is divided into two parts. The eastern half is an independent country called Papua New Guinea. What is the western half called? 
A. Papua Old Guinea. B. Western New Guinea. C. Half Guinea. D. Papua Johns. The answer coming up when we return to The World is Yours. We're back. Let's find out the answer to our question. The island of New Guinea is divided into two parts. The eastern half is an independent country called Papua New Guinea. What is the western half called? A, Papua Old Guinea. B, Western New Guinea. C, Half Guinea. D, Papua Johns. If you said B, Western New Guinea, you're right. The western part of New Guinea is, appropriately, called Western New Guinea. Sometimes referred to as West Papua, it is controlled by Indonesia, unlike Papua New Guinea, which is an independent country all its own. Papua New Guinea occupies half of New Guinea, as well as islands in Melanesia. A very culturally diverse country, it is also very rural, with less than 20% of its entire population living in an urban area. The rest of Papua New Guinea's people live in what are called customary communities, which are lands run by the settlements themselves. Papua New Guinea has the largest portion of its land in the world run this way, with 97% made up of customary communities. Each very different from the next. And with 840 languages still spoken on the island, it's no surprise each is so unique. The island, full of mystery and wonder, is one of the least explored places to date. With tribes of people and entire species of various animals and plants still waiting to be discovered. Some that may have arrived on the island over 40,000 years ago. Who knows, maybe we'll stumble upon something that has never been discovered before. The largest concentration of urban development in Papua New Guinea can be found in its capital city, Port Moresby. It's also the largest city outside Australia and New Zealand in the South Pacific, which made it a major port during the 19th and 20th centuries. The city is known for its amazing coastal housing, lining the gulf at Hanuabada. Ela Beach is a great spot for us to unwind and stroll along the coast of the island. We can swim in the clear blue waters at the Gulf of Papua before heading to our next location. A spirit house is a shrine built to protect the spirit of a place or region. They are often small enough to place on a table, pillar, platform, or altar. These spiritual temples are found in homes and businesses in countries throughout Southeast Asia, like Cambodia, Laos, and Thailand. We'll find spirit houses here in Papua New Guinea, and we'll know we're protected from whatever harm might come our way. Let's see how many different kinds of spirit homes we can find while we travel through the communities of the island. On our way to the Sepik River. But first, let's test your world knowledge. The Sepik River is the longest river on the island of New Guinea. How many miles long is it? A, 100 miles, B, 300 miles, C, 500 miles, D, 700 miles. The answer coming up when we return to The World is Yours. We're back. Let's find out the answer to our question. The Sepik River is the longest river on the island of New Guinea. How many miles long is it? A, 100 miles. B, 300 miles. C, 500 miles. D, 700 miles. If you said D, 700 miles, you're right. The Sepik River is 700 miles long, making it the longest in New Guinea and has a basin, or a pool where the water drains, that is 30,000 square miles large. 
It is also the third largest river on the island by volume. The Sepik River starts in the Victor Emmanuel mountain range, located in the central highlands of Papua New Guinea. From the town of Telefomen, the river heads next to the Indonesian side of the island into West New Guinea, before turning around again and flowing through what is called the Central Depression, through terrain that is otherwise untouched and undisturbed by people and settlements. And boats can navigate down the Sepik River for much of its length. All the swamplands, rainforests, and mountains that make up the Sepik, plus all the wild animals that call the Sepik region home. It's truly a sight to behold. Well, that wraps up our adventure for today. We poked our heads through the clouds of the Pacific Northwest in the iconic Space Needle and watched fish fly through the air at the Pike Place Market in Seattle. We camped out in the Gorky Terrells National Park where we rode camels across the plains and through all the amazing rock formations in Mongolia. And we paddled down the Sepik River exploring undiscovered forests and the communities within them, deep in Papua New Guinea. Thanks for joining us on our trip around the world. There are still many more adventures to come. Until next time, the world is waiting, and the world is yours.